Hello, and welcome back to Zim Explorer. I am Dr. Abstract, and in this Zim Explorer, we're going to continue to take a look at a kid's app where we were doing some counters and a, a shaking cup. Why don't we go take a peek at it now? Uh, this will be at zimjs.com slash elearning slash shake, I believe. So uh, we'll post the link down below. And this is the second part. So if you've just arrived here and haven't seen the first part, you might want to take a look at the last explore. Ooh, desktop reveal. OK, so this is um, this is the app right here. Ooh, we've left on an outline on the cup. Well, why don't we turn that off and we can just have a peek. There's the outline on the cup. Remember, you can use outline anytime you want to see where the bounds of an object are, its origin inside a container, for instance, and its registration point, which is where the X and Y is, and what it will spin about or rotate about, and what it will scale about. So we have some animation. We do have backing music as well. And then uh, we are pressing, and dropping some things into a cup. We are then shaking the cup up. Oh, we've got slow motion. <laughs> so we got a slow motion animation of this thing. Uh, <laughs> classic, huh? Dun, dun, dun. And there they are. And then the idea is you would say that there are three blues and happens to be three pinks and a total of six. Oh, we're all so happy. OK, great. So we got to a point where we have We've talked about our pain here. We've talked about the animating in, some of the sound issues uh, or, uh, that we have to click on it before sound comes. Also remembering sound. We maybe haven't seen these buttons yet, but we'll see that soon. And we're just about to drop one of these coins or one of the um, counters into the cup. So let's go to the code now and see where we're at. Here's the cup. We uh, I have also seen the counter. Great. And now we're, um, we've are we made a container right here. So this is all new right now. Oh, I hope this was big enough for you the last time. I realize my font wasn't all that big, but maybe it's not too bad. I'm used to teaching, and when we teach, we want to make sure that that's big. Maybe it was OK for you on a computer screen. Yeah, there we go. So we're making a container to hold all of our counters. And we want that container to be added to the cup as well, so that as the cup rotates, all of our counters will rotate with it as well. We're making a container specific for the counters so that we can loop through that container and do things with the counters, such as find the number of them, find their colors, that kind of stuff. So we're calling that counters. And then here is the drop. All right. So here's our function drop. Function drop happens when we mouse down on the counter. Uh, we talked about how we didn't make that a dot tap on there because tap requires uh, a down and up in the same location. And what if they sort of swept those coins trying to drag them into the cup? Wouldn't actually activate them. Whereas a, a mouse down will activate it right as you start to drag. Right, so here's the function drop. Now, the problem is uh, th th it's pretty easy to drop something into a cup. It really is just animating. So it, it would be like this. If we, if we just wanted to drop that into a cup, I wouldn't even run this here. I'd run an arrow function like that. And it would be whatever this is called, counter.animate. We might animate the Y position to 300 more. So this is a relative 300. If we put quotes around it, it means 300 from its current location. And that would do it. There we go. I just dropped the counter in the cup. It would take one second by default. If we wanted it shorter amount of time, we would go 0.7 seconds. So that would be dropping a counter in the, in the cup. And do you want to see it? So we got rid of what was there before. And we save this. And we refresh here. We'll view a local version. I think this is a local version. Yeah. There it is. Press. Oh, 
did, didn't make it to the bottom. But in general, that's what happened. So I had mentioned in our last explore that this came about because uh, a teacher out in the East Coast was wanting to make a shake and spill game and thought that maybe they could use Zim to do that. And they were using, they did a version in Scratch and we might be comparing Zim to Scratch. And if you see all of what went into making the Zim app, you might be thinking, ooh, that's a lot of code. It's harder than Scratch. Um, there's certain things that we've done to make this app complete uh, so that things can't happen that would break the app and, and a variety of other things like little effects and all that kind of stuff. And that's what this is filled for. And that's why we're doing an explore. We're basically exploring all of the nuances of what went into making this app. If we were trying to match something that happened in Scratch, maybe that's what would happen. Counter.animate a Y of 300 more in an amount of time. You really can't get much simpler than that. This is the counter. We're wanting to animate its Y position 300 more in this amount of time. There's a couple brackets in here, but the reason for these brackets is what if we wanted to spin it? Rotation, colon 360. So this would not only animate its Y position, but it would also rotate it, which actually doesn't work very well with a circle. <laughs> but if it weren't a circle, if it were a rectangle, new rectangle, we could, we could actually see it spin. Uh, we better go 40 by 40, comma, blue. Did we center reg it? And we better dot center reg that too, center reg. Okay, let's have a look. So there it is, and as I drop, there it spins as it falls. So what we've, what we've done there is we've animated two different properties at the same time. That's what these squiggly brackets are for, to make our object literal that says the property name and the value we want to operate, the property name and the value. You cannot get animation that is simpler than that. Scratch doesn't do it. Scratch, you've got to drag all these little boxes and then, you know, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and so almost everything we do in Zim will actually be easier than it is to do in Scratch. It's just we've added a lot of extra things here to sort of go beyond what people would normally build in Scratch. And we're exploring those now. All right, so I'm going to turn that back into a circle. We are wanting to go back all the way until this says drop, drop. There we go. So here's what we're doing in drop. One of the problems is, is as it's dropping, if they tilt the cup, then the coin would not have finished its, its Y position. It's, the coin would have been halfway through it. And when we, when we rotate the cup, the coin would end up animating possibly to the wrong position or slower or whatever. Um, in the end, we decided we've got a bunch of different animations aside from just the Y. There's also the fact that we're spinning it and we wanted the coin to sort of stay at a certain, um, you know, to stay at a, a no spin basically when we, when we animate it over. So we just decided that we would not let the person shake the cup when something is currently dropping. Okay. That makes it a little bit harder. What you would normally do is just say something, well, what you could normally do is not activate the cup at all until the drop has finished. So when we animate, we can call a call. Here's an example of a call. Animate, animate, here's one right here. So we're animating the Y position 400 more. We're going to bounce out. By the way, that gives a bounce to, to it. So as it animates and hits the bottom, boing, 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 it will bounce as it's going out. If we said in, out, then it would bounce in and bounce out, which we don't really want. We just want to bounce on the outside. And then call this function when we're done. So that's how we call a function when we're finished animating. Basically, we, sh we could have said cup, well, something like this. When we press down, which is at the top of the drop, we might have said cup dot no mouse. This means, hey, 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 sorry, you cannot use the mouse on the cup. Uh, basically, no mouse is a Zim combination. So it's a Zim 
<clears throat> method, it's actually a relatively new Zim method, that combines uh, two properties, cup dot mouse children um, is equal to false, so that's a property, and cup dot mouse enabled is equal to false. That's what no mouse does. This has been around all of interactive media's life, if interactive media has a life. So back in Director, we had these. Back in 1995, making CD-ROMs, we had mouse children and mouse enabled, false. It's needed. Sometimes you don't want to be able to interact with the children. That's the things inside of a container. And uh, sometimes we don't want the mouse to be enabled on the container. So there's a big difference there. Mouse enabled on the container just says the container will not get the mouse, but its children will. Okay, that's the difference. <laughs> right, so if, if you want to turn off all mouse interaction, you've got to turn both of those off. Well, that's a little bit tricky for the average person to understand why we need that. We need it, we need it because we made lots of interactivity and we know we need both those things. But to sort of know that without knowing it is, is not, it's, it's not obvious. So we decided to introduce a, a method here. This is also chainable called no mouse. No mouse will activate both of those properties like that. So we don't, we don't need them. So this says, hey, you can't, uh, you can't click on the cup. Okay. Then when we finish animating right here uh, in the call, we could say, hey, cup, we're now done animating cup dot mouse put those mouses back on like that so that's how it can be done this is with um this is with display objects such as uh, various shapes or containers or whatever for controls or for components sorry components have an enabled and an enabled false and enabled true so you can set those rather than the mouse and the no mouse. No mouse and no mouse would work on those as well, but the components have built in enabled and enabled false, enabled true. Anyway, here we are enabling the cup again. But, and this, this would be great. Hey, uh, not bad. And as a matter of fact, this is how we did it initially. And then we tested the app and realized that we had a problem. If you clicked on more than one counter, while like so a whole bunch of them are animating, what happens is uh, when one of that bunch gets to the end, it turns the mouse of the cup on. Well, the other ones that were still animating aren't finished yet. So you could turn the cup while the other ones are still <laughs> animating. So it's like, oh, darn, there's a bug. That's a bug. So we have an option at that point. We could say, hey, to the coin, don't allow the coin to be pressed until the, uh, the coin that you've just dropped have, has reached the bottom. So don't allow multiple coin, or they're not coins, multiple counters, <laughs> multiple counters to fall at the same time. And it's kind of like, oh, well, that's too bad. I like it, I like it when multiple uh, counters fall. Oh, gosh. How about round counters, though? <laughs> it's a, like a comedy routine here, isn't it? I like it when I can... Oh, and see, I can't actually... Oh, right, yes, because uh, we turned off the interactivity for the cup. What we really intended to do was turn off interactivity for the cup pick, because it's the cup pick that actually gets um, uh, shaken, or like gets pressed on to shake the cup pick not the container. This coin is inside the container. So uh, this is actually a good example of turning off the mouse. Look, I can't click multiple ones of those until the one hits the bottom. So we could have done that, but it's just like, that's too bad. That's really annoying because I liked it better. So what we should have been doing there is cup pick dot mouse and cup. no mouse so it's the cup pick that is actually getting the uh, the action so here we go I like that I like being able to drop a bunch of them in there at a time seems natural so anyway that was breaking because when the one got to the bottom and other ones were falling one got to the bottom it turned the mouse back on and you could flip the cup while other while ones were falling 
and it's like, oh darn. So it's a little bit trickier than just choosing a check variable or turning off the mouse or the no mouse. So let's get rid of those. We had to scratch our head a little bit about it, not too long, maybe oh, less than five minutes, hopefully, and say, ah, wait a minute, I have an idea. Why don't we set a timer? So if, if coins always take about one second to fall, and we could have, instead of hard coding a one second, we could have found out how long they are actually taking to fall, which was oh, down below inside here. Anyway, it is, uh, it might, I think it is one second. So we basically said, let's set a counter of one second that will give enough time for the coin to fall. And every time we make Oh, they're not coins. <laughs> My apologies. We're dealing with kids here. I don't know. I guess kids can handle with coins, but for some reason, I feel, feel like coins involve gambling or something, which don't necessarily go all that well with kids. Uh, anyway, they're, they're counters. If I say coin, I mean counter. Is that okay if I say? Yeah, okay. Anyway, uh, we're waiting for the counter to fall. So it's going to take one second. And if as soon as we click on, a, on the counter, it'll take yet another second. So when the counter is done, we will set this drop timer to null. So drop timer is actually the, uh, a way that we could clear. If we wanted to, we could clear the timeout. But basically what we're saying is we're going to have no drop timer really. We, we will put something in there, but at the moment, drop timer is null. If there is a drop timer, we clear it. We turn off that interval. So we're kind of using a check variable and a timer all in one, uh, and it's called drop timer. That's a name that we've made up. So if there is a drop timer, we're going to clear the, the timeout, and then we say the drop timer is this timeout, and after one second, set the drop timer to null. So that basically, if the drop timer is null, it means we're not dropping, All right? And every time we drop a coin, we clear the old timer and start a new timer of one second. And that's, that's the main difference. Every time a coin falls, we start the timer. Whereas the other way, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't quite right. It was like every time the coin starts falling, we turn off the, the cup. But if the coin gets to the bottom, we turn on the cup. But not all the coins have reached the bottom yet. So that get, you know, anyway, it's hard to sometimes describe <laughs> describe things like that, but hopefully I have, I've tried a few times. Uh, anyway, here we are using a timer. Now this is all logic that we have to put in place so that stuff, you know, so that stuff doesn't break. Sometimes in coding and programming, there is nothing that comes with the language or the framework or anything that will handle that. It's you just got to put that logic in there for you. OK, so uh, that's the scoop. That's how we handled that. And there's some description there. You can read over that and mull it over. We are getting the number of children. Uh, why are we doing that? Oh, we don't. Uh, what is oh right when we play the sound this is kind of neat i don't know if you notice this but each time we play a sound the sound goes up in pitch uh, this is um we borrowed this sound from an old game that we made called gobstop where every time you clicked on the gobstop it was like licking it and it's uh it's lick sound would get uh, you know like doop 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 like that uh, these days we actually have a Zim synth and we might want to play the sounds with the Zim synth and then we could change the pitch with, with programming. So we wouldn't have to do doop 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 as different sounds. Right now we have all of those doop 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 doops coming in as different sounds here. Here they are. Wee! Doop 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 doop. <laughs> Uh, do you believe me? So what we're doing is we're playing a higher pitch dupe each time we drop one of those coins. Let's see, where was the dropping of the coins? There it is. So depending on how many counters we have, when we have zero counters, when the num children, that's how many children are in the counters container, uh, if that's zero, then it will be, we'll go for the asset, which is called B zero, 
mp3 and we'll play it at that volume. If the sound is toggled. The sound is a toggle button. It's right here. This toggle right here. And if it's toggled, which it is right now, we're going to play the sound. Let's try again. If it's not toggled, we don't play the sound. So if the sound is toggled, we play the sound. Otherwise, it's not going to play the sound. We're also playing a bounce sound as well, and we're waiting a little bit of, of time. Uh, this is like part way through the animation. We just decided three seconds, or, or point three seconds, sorry, 300 milliseconds. We are going to go and do this bounce sound. A bounce sound is also going to play a couple times when we tilt the cup. So we had some code right inside of here in, in a, an arrow function. We had the code right in the arrow function, but when we needed the same code again later, we said, okay, let's abstract that code because it's in common, and we'll put it in one place. And then we'll call that one place from each of those places. <laughs> so the one place is the bounce sound function, which is right down here somewhere. Bounce sound. So here's the stuff that was uh, that was in there. First of all, if we're if the sound isn't toggled on, then just get out of here. Don't even bother playing. Then we're going to play the click sound. We're going to wait 0.2 seconds, and we're going to play the click sound. We're going to wait two seconds, and we're going to play the click sound. I could, eh, maybe could have done that in another way, but that's how we did it. Okay, that's tick 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 tick, or it's just tick tick tick, and it gets lower in volume. Tick tick tick. <laughs> uh, that's the bounce sound. Okay, great. So we're playing the bounce sound. Dropping, dropping, dropping. Where did we get to? There it is. All right. What about uh, the new counter? because the counter, it actually stays up there. The count, whenever we click it, usually it stays up there. See how the counter stays here? Basically, well, <laughs> except for the last one. <laughs> Go figure. So the counter stays up there except for the last one, which is the 10th one. So we're making a clone of the counter. Clone is the way in Zim that we can copy it. So there it is, cloning the counter and keeping it as a reference called copy. We're adding it to counters. When we clone it, it will get the same X and Y. Yay! <laughs> so we don't have to worry about where we add it because the X and Y is already set because we just cloned something that had an X and Y. So we just add it to the counters. We don't have to locate it. We give it a random rotation. Now a circle, I was saying a circle doesn't matter if it's rotated, but it does matter if we're changing the scale X. So the way that we're going to make the coin look like it's uh, rotating, see how it looks like it's spinning, is by animating its scale x right here. So we're animating the scale x to 0 in a random time between these two times. So that, that means they're going to go at different speeds. Now if we only go to 0, that means it's going to squeeze the coin to 0 and the rewind will make it go back out to 1. We have an option. We could have gone to minus 1 here. So that would go from 1 in scale through 0 and go to minus 1 and back again. I can't remember why we didn't go to minus 1. Oh, the rewind doesn't happen at the right time. We, we want to change the color on rewind. If we go from 1 to minus 1, uh, we can't change the color as its scale is zero. That's when we want to change the color. When its scale is zero, we change the color, and as it comes back to a positive amount, or whatever, or, or to a negative amount, we would then um, look like the coin is, uh, you know, back to normal, or, or spinning. But anyway, uh, if we if we go to zero, then we can use this rewind time to change the color. So here we are saying, call this function when we're rewinding. 
So imagine that it's fat and it goes to zero. As soon as it goes back to fat, as, as soon as it starts going back to fat, so it's at zero, as soon as it starts to go back to fat, just while it's at zero, that's when the rewind happens. That's when we change the color. Otherwise, we would see the color changing, and that, that's not good. <laughs> get it <laughs> so that's what we're doing and we're looping that as well and so that's the effect of spinning right there that makes it look like it's spinning and we see a color on one side and a color on the other side what are these colors that we're getting well every time we spin we call colors colors is right here colors is a series this is a zim series if you're using the zim namespace you would have zim dot Okay, so this is a zim function that we're quite proud of that will run every time you run the function it will give you the next thing in order and this has saved us countless lines of code well not countless lines but like a line or two of code every time we use it and we use it hundreds and hundreds of times like oh it's just been amazing it's all part of the zim v or pick dynamic parameters so it's really cool. Um, for instance, if we make three dials and we want the dials to be red, yellow, and blue, we can set a style that says, ah, the background color of the dial will have a series of red, green, and blue. And each time a dial gets made, the first time it'll be red, next time it'll be green, next time it'll be blue. If we wanted them random, then we put the colors in an array, pink and blue, like that. What that would do is it would randomly pick from the pick, would randomly pick from those two. Here it picks in the series. We can also pick with min and max. So a min of something, uh, 10 to a max of um, 100. That would pick a number between 10 and 100 each time. It doesn't really relate to colors, but. Uh, yeah. Or we can run a function and have that function uh, return a value, return some value, return uh, true. So if the function returns true uh, one time, uh, the value would be true. If it returns false a different time, like well, not a random number, because random number would have been just that, but whatever the function does, it could return a value. And that value would be picked from, or picked. Actually, it could return one of these things. So you can nest any one of these things. You can put a function inside of here and it will then return the result of that function at this time. You could put something in there. Uh, I don't know about that actually, uh, but you could do it in series. You could put a bunch of functions. You could put random things in the series. Anyway, zim pick is pretty amazing. Series as well don't have to go this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. Series can go um, a bunch of them and then backwards and then forwards. It could um, go every second one. It can um, uh, go uh, twice on this one, twice on this one, twice on this one. Twice. So there's a bunch of different ways that you can modify a series. It could just go to the end and then stay at the end. It can go in reverse. So there's uh, all sorts of things like uh, you could dot reverse this and it would reverse that series. It would do this one, then this one, then this one, then this one, then this one. We only have two, so it's not much of a difference. Okay, so basically there it is. We're, each time we rewind, we're switching the color of that series. And we're animating. That was animating the spin of it this by the scale x and this is animating mm, the ending location so we waited a little bit in time as this is falling and then we quickly within that minute so we waited 0.6 seconds and then 0.4 seconds so we move it to an x of um, minus 50 to 50. Uh, this is relative position. So this is quite easy to do. We could we could rand or we could have passed in that aforementioned min max in there as well. Uh, we could have passed a min max and it would have chosen the min max. But the problem is, is then you'd get a number like 27. This is an x position of 27 from the 0, 0 origin. Okay, it's not a relative. That is relative. We want 50, uh, 50 to the left or 50 to the right of where it currently is. So this coin is falling and I want 50 to the left, 50 to the right, or 25 to the left, or you know, three to the right. That it's gonna be somewhere in, in there. 
if I wanted it never to be near zero, say I wanted a range of kind of like 30 to 50, but also negative 30 to 50. We can do that with Rand by saying 30 to 50 right here. And then Rand, if we look at the Zim docs, I can't remember which parameter it is. So we'll go to the docs right here and look up Rand like that. Integer and then negative range. So we need to bypass the integer null and true. What this would do, it, was, it would give us a random number between 30 and 50 or negative 30 and 50 so that it either goes to the left or the right but not in the center. Isn't that cool? That's there because we've been building interactive media for many many years since the 90s and we know we need that sometimes and so we built that right into the Zim Rand. Very cool huh? Anyway regardless this would be a number not a like it's not a string. So to make it relative, so it's just going 30 to 50 on the left or 30 to 50 on the right, then we would want a string. And we can't just put this in a string like that. That doesn't work. So we cast the value as a string. String, please. There we go. So now this is saying turn that number into a string. And let's see what we get. Now we're going to get coins that are different from before. Oh, darn, I just had a before. The before was they're randomly 50 to 50 on this side to negative 50. So randomly end up somewhere in there. Now they're going to end up 30 to 50 on this side or 30 to 50 on that side. Okay, 30 to 50 on this side or 30 to 50 on this side, but none between the 30s, 30 and negative 30. Neat, huh? Anyway, that's not what we want. We just want minus 50 to, oops, minus 50 to 50. However, we do want the string for relative position. And we're waiting. This last one is the bouncing. So this is the Y. And look, there's our, our relative Y for 400 down from where we are. Or we could have just calculated that. I think we started 100 up, so we could probably have just said 300 to position 300. Anyway, there we are, and we're bouncing out. So that means we're going to bounce at the end. And uh, we're calling the function of what we do when we come back. Let's have a look. And whoop. Boing, boing. So something happens at the end there. It kind of, I can kind of see it like snapping to a color. And there, there they all are in there, bouncing. I can see it snapping to a color, and we played around with this a, a little bit. One, because we're spinning, uh, or because we're yeah spinning a random amount of time here, and we're changing the color each time, we could just leave it. We could just say, oh, don't bother snapping to a color. Uh, I'll show you what snap. Here's the snapping to the color. That's what I mean by that. We did bring it back to a scale of one immediately. We, we animated it back to a scale, but it wasn't really worth it by the, you know, the quickness that we have to bring that back to a scale of one. I don't think we really notice. But what you do notice sometimes is the color changing. Let's, let's see what this looks like now. So you'll see the, um, you'll see the snap to the, the, uh, the scale, but we don't change the color. The problem is, Sounds like we have a visitor out there. <laughs> Here's our slow motion tilt. The problem is, it was almost, it's, it's, it's like coming out um, more pink than blue. So we were finding out we're only getting one or two blues. We hardly ever got more than three blues. And so it, there's something to do in the actual timing here based, uh, you know, I, I don't know what it was. Something to do with the timing that it wasn't coming out random. It was weighted one direction. And we just said, ah, okay, I can't be bothered. So here, here we are just saying, let's set the color to a random number. If it's greater than 0 0.5, because rand will just give you between zero and one, not including one. So if it's greater than 0 0.5, we'll choose pink, else we'll choose blue. That's the JavaScript ternary operator that allows us to do a condition here 
If that's true, then assign what's, or you know, represent what's after the, the question mark. Otherwise, represent what's after the colon. So it's like a little if, else, all, all in one right there. So that's what's getting us our random color. We'll let the cup have a cursor if it's had more than three children, and we'll let the, um, the counter go away. So we've removed the counter if we're greater than or equal to 10 children. So there you go. We, uh, uh, you don't have, like, I mean, if, if we took this off like that, then we could uh, throw any number. Uh, uh, but we've just said here, as it says here, uh, drop three to ten counters. Now that's not true. There's one counter. Oh, maybe it is true still. What did we do? Uh, well, there's three. I don't, maybe I didn't save. Or perhaps it was... Oh, that was just the cursor. Right, so that's um, saying show the cursor. It wasn't actually affecting our, our turn. Um, I hear... <laughs> guests. <laughs> I hear uh, holiday guests and I'm wondering if it's my family is here and we're in uh, Zim Explorer. So why don't we do three explorers on this I guess and I'll go see if indeed I have a holiday guest. I'm going to go explore out there in the real world to see if I've got a holiday guest. <laughs> I am Dr. Abstract. We'll see you in the next Explorer, huh? I don't know. Oh, there's a great conclusion to this. You gotta come back for the next Explorer. Cheers.